Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tatiana Show. We're doing a second episode today, but you know what? I don't even know why I changed my shirt, because if I was going to tell you that we were doing the same episode on the same day, I could have just not changed. But whatever. Um, anyway, I'm psyched because I added this show last minute because there are two cool dudes that I wanted to show support for, and they're launching things um, this week and last week, a little combo special. Um, our first guest, well, wait, first of all, I'll give you guys a teaser. Our two guests today are Travis Irvine and uh, Brian Sovereign. So Brian wrote a book. Travis is a funny bastard, and he made a CD about it. So um, I'm really looking forward to talking with them both. But first, we're going to bring on Travis. Travis, welcome to the show. Hello, Tatiana. It's nice to see you, not in person, but via Skype. Hello. Yes, well, we seem to have a problem seeing each other in person, um, but, yeah, you know. The last time I saw you, was at your birthday party, or was it, it was probably at a Gary Johnson Libertarian function somewhere. Oh, Orlando, I think it was Orlando. Oh, yes, well, that was, a, I liked the Libertarian Party convention. That was the main one last year. Um, that one was a good one. And remember, it was Comic-Con at the same venue, so there were people walking around in superhero costumes, and I was just like, they must be Libertarian. I don't know. <laughs> yes, no, I, I think I felt the same way. There's a lot of uh, variety of types of people um, at, at libertarian conferences. Mm -hmm. so, yes, that's you know, what makes them libertarian, yeah. Exactly, I love that about them. Um, so we've known each other for a while, but you've been doing comedy even longer than you've known me. So for people who are not familiar with your work, maybe you could give me a little bit of background about how you became um, a comedian and also how you became a libertarian. Well, sure, I mean... I guess it's a long road, just like anybody. Um, but my passions have always been comedy, journalism, video production, uh, traveling, and then politics. So I've always tried to find a, a lifestyle and a career that combines all of those things. Um, so really about 10 years ago, 2007, I'd say that's when all of it kind of got started, was when I, I graduated from Ohio University. And like any good broke millennial, I had nothing to do. And I moved back home with my parents in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, at that time, uh, I was kind of dabbling in stand-up comedy. Um, but uh, I went to Bonnaroo and uh, saw uh, David Cross and Louis Black uh, do stand-up comedy for, you know, thousands of people. And I went to the shows over and over. And it was finally, I was like, all right, that's part of what I want to do. So I started to do stand-up comedy every single week in Columbus, Ohio. That was also the same time that uh, I remember May 2007, uh, a thing called the Ron Paul moment happened in a Republican uh, presidential primary debate where Ron Paul spoke out and said that uh, he was a, an anti-war Republican. And I know that was like a moment for a lot of millennials, you know, who are against Iraq war, not necessarily pro-Bush and Cheney, but still kind of conservative in a way. That was a big moment. And, you know, they actually call that the Ron Paul moment because it, it was when he finally came out and spoke out against uh, wars and American imperialism and things like that. So I immediately became obsessed with Ron Paul. And uh, at that same time, I decided to run for mayor of my hometown, um, which is a small suburb on the east side of Columbus, Ohio. Um, from there, obviously, uh, I ran with the Libertarians. I got more involved with the Libertarians. I ran for Congress as a Libertarian in 2010. Um, did not win, but we had a, a great showing. We made a lot of funny videos that got on CNN and PBS's NewsHour. And then in 2012, I graduated from Columbia Journalism School, which is a very left-leaning uh, school, but I was like the token libertarian there. And then that's the year that uh, after I graduated, obviously Gary Johnson's uh, campaign was in full swing. Um, so that's when I joined up and worked on that. That's when I met you when you did our rally at NYU that year. And I've kind of just kept it up ever since. You know, I, I've worked for journalism outlets like Huffington Post. I get the blog for them and be the token libertarian there. I worked for The Guardian, did some uh, climate change comedy content there. And then uh, I was at Vice and Viceland last year doing a lot of political content for the 2016 election. Um, but, you know, I've also worked for guys like Roger Stone and James O'Keefe. So uh, I'm just like a political... Uh, I'm all over the board, you know. I, I'm friends with a top advisor to Jill Stein last year. So I kind of like uh, being part of all the political conversations. And at the end of the day, I always kind of bring it back into my comedy. And that's what uh, my comedy album guy from Ohio is all about. It's a combination of all my passions, Ohio, politics, and, you know, some libertarian fun things like drugs and, like, stuff like that. 
Yeah, that's got to be a popular one. You know, before we got onto the show, I was wondering, um, since you've sort of been the token libertarian guy in a lot of uh, leftist uh, organizations and, and news um, outlets, what's your, how, how does that feel? Do they give you like kind of guff about it? Would you, how do you, how do you bring them over into the ideas of freedom? How's that been going in terms of evangelizing um, to, to that group? Where, where do you see the parallels? I mean, it's definitely a lot of policy discussions, you know, it's like, and you know, from going to libertarian conventions, like the, the one in Orlando, libertarians can stay up all night debating policy and philosophy and, uh, you know, the, the way libertarian ideas relate to all of those. And yeah, uh, people on the left are very much the same. I've had some very heated arguments with friends at bars and eventually we're like yelling at each other. Sometimes it goes nowhere. So what I really try to focus on are issues where um, progressives on the left and libertarians on the right agree. I really actually think that going forward, that's that's going to be the holy political alliance that's actually going to make a difference in this country. Are all these young uh, progressive Bernie millennials on the left, and all these young uh, libertarian Ron Paul Rand Paul millennials on the right? And because they all agree on, I think, some bigger issues, um, respecting constitutional liberties. You know, there's the Fourth Amendment caucus right now in Congress where it's. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Zoe Longren and Jared Polis uh, on the left and guys like Justin Amash and Thomas Massey on the right. And they all agree on just protecting the Fourth Amendment. Um, same deal, you got Ron Wyden and, and Rand Paul have always worked together on those issues too. Um, you know, that's just a basic one. Hey, respect our basic constitutional liberties. Um, and then there's things that, that go along with that, like criminal justice reform and the legalization of marijuana and reforming our, our country's drug laws and ending the drug war. Um, you know, uh, progressives and and libertarians again agree on a lot of that. Rand Paul and uh, Cory Booker even tried to work on that with mandatory minimums. Um, along those same lines, uh, imperialism, the American military industrial complex, right? The fact that we spend what hundreds of billions, seven hundred to eight hundred billion, and I think Trump just raised it even more, um, which was very anti-libertarian of him. You know, he spoke out against the Iraq War, which I think. A lot of veterans liked him for uh, within the Republican primary and things like that. But then he went and raised the military budget by $50 billion more dollars. So that's another area where progressives and libertarians agree. Granted, libertarians would like to see hundreds of billions of uh, dollars back in taxpayers' hands, and that's cool. Uh, progressives would probably like to see that going into things like health care and education and the environment. Whatever it is, though, you know, I think we – all agree that the the age of American imperialism is just it's taken its toll you know the country's in debt um, we're ignoring a lot of problems at home domestic problems because we're spending all this money overseas so that's another area where progressives and libertarians agree then I think you know once we solve those big issues these big issues where we can save a lot of money and uh, and save a lot of people's like liberties and freedoms and stop meddling with affairs overseas. I think once we solve those, then I would like to see the progressives and libertarians go ahead and debate very civilly um, the the benefits of government, uh, you know, involvement or non-involvement in education, environment, social security, healthcare, all that stuff. You know, that's a debate I'd love to have, but I want to have it between the libertarians on the right and the progressives on the left. You know, because there's so many bigger issues to solve first, and then we can all sit around and debate the the benefits or the non-benefits of, of government involvement and, you know, social services and things like that. But so do you think the libertarians are the right? Like, where is the place at the table for people that are just straight up conservative? Or do you think we're just kicking them out? Sorry, dudes. I, you're out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, no, I, I, with the millennial generation, you know, millennial generation, there, there are some Trump kids in there and there are some evangelical Christians in there. But for the most part, um, I feel, uh, you know, conservative millennials are definitely more libertarian. They're definitely, um, they're definitely okay with people smoking pot and not going to jail for it. They're definitely okay with, um, with uh, you know, if they have a family member or a friend who's gay, they definitely want them to get married. Um, and uh, you know, same deal with abortions. Like, well, my sister had her uh, fifth abortion; she should be allowed to do that. You know, um, it, it's really about. The, and there's a conservative argument to be made for that. You know, it's why would why is the government, you know, if I don't want the government involved in my business and, and I want the government out of my wallet, then I want them out of my bedroom. I want them out of 
my girlfriend's uterus. I want them out of my buddy's lungs. I want them out of, you know, um, I want them out of my life. So uh, it's a it's a good argument, I think, uh, for conservatives to make for being what we commonly call a socially liberal. But, you know, it's just socially tolerant. It's just common sense, really, at this point, I think. Um, so you've been doing this for a long time. Do you, where do you see the climate going? Do you think that there is a shift toward libertarianism or, I mean, I think that maybe we've dug in the heels of the left a lot harder just because of this past election, which I find insane because it's like everybody rallied around that monstrosity Hillary. And I was like, didn't she just cheat your guy? And didn't your yeah. guy just kind of take it? Like I'm completely mystified by that. Um, so I don't know. Uh, what do you what do you think is the the climate now? You know how do yeah, you think no. things are going? Again, I mean, you know, I don't think it's. I like to call it libertarian views. You know, these areas again where the progressives, the Bernie kids on the left, and the the libertarian kids on the right agree. Um, I do think it's going to head more that way because it's just how the millennial generation is, um, and we agree on those issues. And and I would say the Bernie people they didn't really rally behind Hillary at all. It's still very split. Um, you know, some of them sucked it up and did did their liberal duty and just voted for Hillary. But I have plenty of friends who said, screw it, I'm voting for Jill Stein or I'm voting for Gary Johnson, or they just didn't vote. Um, and, you know, I think that's a big reason why Hillary deservedly lost last year because she couldn't rally those people. You're right. They cheated. They cheated, you know. And when that happens and everyone knows it, they're not going to su support you. So, um yeah, I, I think that, honestly, the progressives are, are rising on the left. I think it's a good thing because, again, they do agree with us on multiple uh, on libertarians with multiple bigger issues. Um, even the Federal Reserve, you know, Bernie Sanders signed on to help audit the Fed uh, with both Ron He didn't Paul. show up for the vote, vote from what I understand, though. Like, sure, he does but, those but, kinds but, of... But neither did Ted Cruz. In, in years past... I'm Bernie, not on Ted Cruz's team either. Yeah, I know. Yeah, sure. But, you know, Bernie supported in Congress when he was a, a representative from Vermont. He supported it with Ron Paul then, and then he supported it in the Senate with Rand Paul. Um, so, you know, and then he, he uses it as talking points when he's in front of a Wall Street banker or in front of the, you know, the head of the Fed to basically say, why is the Federal Reserve giving out trillions of dollars to these private banks overseas? You know, that was just a partial audit of the Fed. So, um, you know, uh, and... and uh, I, on Sunday, actually, here in Columbus, Ohio, I had the privilege and honor to open up for Dennis Kucinich, who is another guy who's made a very impassioned speech about auditing the Fed. You know, he, he even used the libertarian line, the Federal Reserve is about as federal as Federal Express. Um, and, there's a, you know, he does great speeches about that. So I think we got to start ignoring, honestly, especially this millennial generation. we got to stop. we got to stop dividing ourselves into libertarians and progressives. Or if we want to, we can... We can call ourselves that, but we got to start acknowledging on the areas where we agree. And that's the only way we're going to work together and get it done is by rejecting a lot of these moderate corporate imperialistic, you know, so-called Republicans and Democrats, because I, I do think they're on the way out. It may take our entire lifetimes to see these changes that we want to see, which is kind of a, a bummer to think about being like 70 years old. And it's like, oh, finally, pot's legal. Yay. <laughs> you know? But um, that might be just what we have to do. But we got to work together. I think that there is something to be said for working together. I do, you know, I remember when Bernie was running, I was trying to think of, like, who's the worst of the candidates, right? Because there was no best, and it was trying to, like, rate them in, like, the least. Uh, the problem that I have with um, with the progressive and the socialist kind of thought process is that's how you get places like Venezuela. So I had a really hard time deciding who I thought would actually end up impacting the country more negatively. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if we're going to solve that problem by opening up with that, right? You know, like, hey, by the way, this is why you suck. Oh, do you want to be right. my friend here about my ideas? Like, you want to be yeah. like, this is why you're cool. Yeah. And then you put it in a little sandwich and you say, maybe you could study from Bob Murphy a little bit. And then we can move back to the things we like. Sure. Yeah. for everyone. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, no, I, I think it's seriously it's important to focus on the things we agree on. I don't, I mean, yeah, good Lord. The Bernie people and the, and the libertarian people could debate all night and we would get nowhere on, you know, the, the, the benefits of the free market versus uh, single payer health care. I mean, good Lord. Let's just get these giant, I mean, good, 700 to 800 billion dollars on our military budget every year just because of all our military bases and everything. You know, there were all... 
you look at the main presidential candidates from last year, um, Gary Johnson was anti-war, anti-imperialism. Jill Stein was anti-war, anti-imperialism. Bernie Sanders was anti-war, anti-imperialism. Donald Trump, in theory, was anti-war, but, you know, very vague about it then when it becomes into actual practice because he loves the veterans. He loves the veterans. Um, if he loves the veterans, he should stop sending them stop, to get their uh, arms blown off. Exactly, exactly. You think he would, but, you know, we never know what that guy's thinking. And really, the most imperialistic war hockey candidate ended up being Hillary Clinton because she was openly saying, I'm going to do a no-fly zone over Syria, baby. And everyone, everyone, Bernie Sanders, Gary Johnson, Jill Stein, they were all saying that's a bad idea. That's going to lead to World War III with Russia. So, um, you know, again, I think we got to look at these areas where we agree, and that's the only way we're going to get anything done and battle this old, ugh, just these, I don't know, I consider them just old people within – with old ideas. I can't believe Henry Kissinger is still alive and still has access to the White House. That blows my mind that a 90-something from, you know, the the, the, the post-World War II era still has so much say in our foreign policy. So, well, yeah. we'll see what happens. I think uh, there's a lot of concerns with, um, you know, Trump had a lot of really good rhetoric saying that he was going to make all yeah. these changes. And God damn it, why haven't we locked her up yet? Yeah. waiting <laughs> yeah, yeah, my yeah. favorite thing he said but unfortunately I, I don't really see him kind of living up to that you never know maybe you'll do some things better eh. I mean unfortunately I feel like it almost made people believe in this system because I didn't vote in 2012 uh, I'm sorry in 2016 for a number of different reasons um, you didn't vote at all no I was out of the country and I could have done it in advance but mm -hmm. I didn't really like any of the candidates and I also and, you know, I was underwhelmed with Gary, um, to be honest. Uh, and I also, I have some moral qualms about uh, voting at this point. I think that it kind of makes people think that they're doing something and taking a political action and making a change. And I think it's diverting their um, their energies from actually productive things. So right. I didn't vote. But, but I did think, you know, I was really surprised when Trump won. Yeah, and us too. I was in Albuquerque with the Gary Johnson campaign and a oh, lot of wow. like the, the reason.com people and, you know, mm -hmm. um, news, newsy libertarians, libertarians, outlets and things. And it was nice because no one was overtly sad or happy. You know, we were watching the pictures of all the Trump people going crazy and all the pictures of the Hillary people crying. And we're just all kind of like drinking like, oh, well, we got 3%. That's pretty good. And, oh, wow, Trump pulled it off. That's weird. Ooh, pass the croutons. You know, it was just kind of – it was a very chill evening. And I'm glad I got to spend it there. But I completely hear you about not voting. You know, it's like um, uh, my favorite libertarian comedian, Doug Stanhope, um, who is another big reason why I kind of got involved with libertarianism because uh, I just love his, his stand-up and his style so much. He he once told me that the ultimate libertarian election is, is an election where no one votes. It's a zero, you know, it's a zero confidence vote in, in the government in general. So I can, I'm completely sympathetic to people who don't want to vote anymore. I completely get it, you know? Yeah, I just think it makes me feel like I have a control over something, and I just don't think it's something where I have that much of an influence. But the weird thing about Trump winning was it made me think, wait, is voting real? Like, how did this happen? And I <laughs> threw a parade when I found out he won. And what was weird was that I was on my way to, not because I think that he's so fantastic, but because, A, I think it's like a protest vote in a way. Like, the people's sentiment, while misdirected, was actually, like, libertarian. Um, mm -hmm. And also because Hillary is, like, you know, the worst human being on earth next to her hobby and, like, a few other choice people that she um, hangs out with. So... But people were really surprised at my reaction, and I was like gleeful. And but what was annoying about it was that now I thought, wait, so does that mean that they're actually counting our votes? And it's a little bit disruptive to my, um, you know, desire to just kind of skip that whole political thing and and work on other on other things. Um, well, so you mentioned Gary Johnson. So I was a big supporter in 2012. First it was Ron Paul, and then it moved over to Gary. And I really like Gary. I like his team. I think they're really cool. But I don't know. I feel like they really missed the mark um, in this last election. You know, I find it pretty surprising that in that climate, we weren't able to get more people. There was a lot of money behind it. Yeah. Um, he had a lot of very weird appearances on TV, which were yes. like, dude, what are you doing? Um, yeah. So I don't know. Like, do you, 
and I think that it's kind of weird to me that in 2016, I wasn't as supportive in 2012. And I think part of that was um, Bill Well, who realistically, I don't know that much about, but everybody was complaining about it. And um, and also the, the contentiousness of the nomination um, seemed kind of fraught with a bunch of drama. Mm -hmm. Do you think that anything changed um, on that campaign trail? And like, where do you think that we could do better in the future? Or is that something that you're even committing to um, in terms of like, do you think that the Libertarian Party will ever be successful? Are we wasting our time and money? Yeah. A lot of people think that it's like the biggest sinkhole in all of Liberty. And you know, after seeing what happened in 2016, I'm kind of like, dudes, like I should have ran. I would have gotten more votes than that guy. I mean, and, and Gary's great. He's very qualified, but we definitely missed an opportunity there, I think. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I think it's kind of like the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. There's a lot of people, you know, uh, last year, Granted, yes. Was there opportunity to go even bigger? Um, was there, you know, did it seem like this was the Libertarian Party's moment? Um, yes. Uh, could we have maybe done better? Yeah. Um, in a lot of states, we did very well, you know. Um, but also, it's like, yeah, Gary Johnson only got 8 to 9% in the state that he was governor in. Um, at the same time, it's the most the Libertarian Party has ever gotten for a presidential candidate in that state. So you kind of have to look at it, um, I think, both ways, because there's a lot of people within the Libertarian Party who are like, this is great. 3% is the most a Libertarian Party candidate has ever gotten. And it is because Gary was so qualified, and it is because um, Trump was so bad and there were conservatives looking for another option. Um, I do think we have to take into consideration, you know, first of all, yes, Gary is a sweetheart, but yes, he also um, screwed up a couple of big, big opportunities. But we also have to keep in mind that the mainstream media was always looking for that. They were always looking sure. for him to screw up, and then that's what happened. You got a 15-second clip of him saying, what's Aleppo? And he just plays over and over and over. It doesn't matter that the question from Mike Barnacle at 7.30 in the morning on Morning Joe was completely out of context. They were talking about something else entirely, and then Barnacle's like, what do you think of Aleppo? And then Gary's like, Look at him like, what, what's a level? What are you talking about? And of course, Gary has this sensible uh, stance on Syria, and he knows a, a lot about it, and, and you know, and he knows his foreign policy. But at the same time, you know, the media was looking for something to get him on. And I can assure you that, you know, again, Gary is a sweetheart, and no one felt worse about that than Gary Johnson. I remember the first rally they had after that Aleppo uh, thing. It was in uh, at the Marriott in New York City. Uh, the same weekend as, uh, uh, not Freedom Fest, but Liberty Fest in New York City. Um, and I know Austin Peterson was speaking there, and Gary Johnson was having his own thing somewhere else. So I know there's that divide within the Libertarian Party, and we can talk more about that later. But, you know, Gary just, the first thing he said when he came out of this rally was, I am so sorry about this Aleppo thing. He's like, you've all been working so hard, and we've got so much money and everything behind this, and then I go and do something stupid like that. And he just apologized, because that's the type of guy Gary is. But I also don't think it's entirely – like he should have been ready for the media to, to look for something like that because you give them something like that, they're going to run with it. Um, we also need to remember that uh, it wasn't just you know Trump's campaign that was uh, anti-Gary. It was Hillary's campaign. Hillary's campaign, they were nervous that Gary was going to pull all the Bernie people, so they threw $55 million um, against Gary, you know, the, Gary's campaign, I think, raised a total of fifteen million or something around there, plus a couple of super PACs here and there, uh, with a couple million. But um, at the end of the day, fifty-five million from the Hillary people, from the Hillary bots, to just take down Gary. I mean, I don't think they were doing themselves any favors because, you know, uh, the numbers show that sixty-five percent of Republicans were the ones who ended up voting for Gary Johnson. And, you know, if, if Hillary's people were smart, they would have used $55 million to, to boost Gary uh, within conservative circles. But they're not smart. It was one of the worst campaigns in, in American history, worst run campaigns in American history. So, you know, I think we've got to keep in mind uh, on what the Libertarians, uh, what their accomplishment, what the Libertarian Party's uh, accomplishments have been in the past and how this year was a success in many ways. And I think we also need to take into context, you know, what Gary Percy was uh, was up against, um, you know, and I always joke too that uh, that uh, a lot of people would always ask me is like, so did Gary really uh, fulfill his promise to stop smoking weed during the campaign? And it's like, you know, I don't know. I think um, I think he was smoking a, a strain called What's Aleppo, and uh, it was so good it made him forget he was running for president sometimes. So um, you know, it's hard to say. 
what, uh, what, what could have changed and what could have been different. But I think it was an achievement for the Libertarian Party to get the, the most votes they ever could, to have a, a very two very qualified candidates like Gary and Bill Well, despite all their flaws, which um, that everyone was upset about. And, and, you know, and now we can go into your other part of your question. Um, about uh, the Libertarian Party itself and where it goes from here, because you're right, there, you know, there are some anarchists and things like that within the Libertarian Party where it is just like, you know, I'm wondering, well, why be involved with a political party at all? If you're just, you know, if you're just start, trying to start infighting within a political party that typically gets 1% of the popular vote, then maybe you shouldn't be, maybe your goals are outside of politics. I think the legit chance for the libertarian party is to be that third political party but we you know we gotta keep in mind that a lot of people just have never heard of us you know there's more people who have never heard of us than who actually vote for us every four years you know what i mean like uh in orlando is just a very good experience for me to like be there and see all the infighting between the austin peterson people and the the uh that well, who's that guy from uh, new hampshire yeah oh Mac. Oh, daryl perry well yeah daryl well, perry um, and the Larry Sharps, and you know, we can have all that infighting and all that debate all we want, but at the end of the day, there are millions of people who've never even heard of us. I was staying with my half sister, who is a single mom raising three kids, and you know, she's asking me, like, well, I, you know, she, all she knew about the election was that Hillary's corrupt and Trump's crazy, and she was like, who's Gary Johnson? You know, she doesn't know who the Libertarian Party is. So we have to keep in mind that. You know, we have a legit chance to become the third political party because we have so many issues that neither Republicans or Democrats are talking about. But, um, you know, if we're just going to sit around and talk about whether or not we should have driver's licenses, I mean, like, I get it. It's a good ideological conversation to have, but that's not the thing that people are thinking about right now. You know, if I, if I take a nice general stance, like I was talking to my sister about, like, ending the drug war. She's like, yeah, I have multiple friends who are in jail for possession of drugs or for, you know, getting caught with using drugs or maybe they were in a bad spot and they're trying to sell drugs and then they get caught and they get thrown in jail and their lives are ruined. That's a thing that actually where the rubber meets the road, where it's a libertarian idea and we can talk to actual people about how it affects them. Um, Okay, I have a lot of things actually uh, about All that. Right, don't don't load your questions too much because I realize my answers will be too long. If you no, 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 it's okay. We're just talking. Like, yeah. Okay. Um. So number one, I wanted to say that you know I feel like the Kerry campaign, in addition to being a bit polarizing within the within the system, um, was just kind of underwhelming. Like there's no razzle dazzle and. He's he's a really nice guy, but he needs to be more like da 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 da, you know, like yeah. Trump won because he's like a freaking maniac. Right. And but in a way, I would have I would have preferred that um that Mac McAfee McAfee whatever got the the nomination because they had Judd Weiss and he was making these really powerful videos, and mm -hmm. McAfee would have done crazy stuff too. It's like you all crazy, we got crazy, yeah. and um and maybe that would have brought I don't think that would have gotten us three percent. I, I would have really? gotten us the usual one percent. Yeah, yeah. Because really? why do you what, think? Because you don't think he was qualified. Yes. Yeah. Because McAfee was crazy in the debates. He kept saying, "I feel like I've been on a six-month acid trip." And I'm looking at him like, "I think you have been too." <laughs> why, why are you here? Just go invent cool things and and cool new drugs. You know. Um, the only but, reason Gary got three percent is because normal people could at least say, "Well, at least he's qualified." We got to remember outside of the little libertarian bubble that people are just looking for a better option, but they still want it to be qualified. John McAfee going around saying crazy things. You know, a lot of people rallied around Trump, not because he was saying crazy things, but because he was the Republican conservative mantra. I think Gary actually lost a lot of um, potential votes in those last few weeks as the race between Hillary and Trump tightened up and the FBI stuff happened and the John Podesta emails happened. That's when I think a lot of conservatives, because I remember Gary was once at like second place in Utah and stuff. But you know, you look at numbers like that in the weeks right before the election, the Republicans were just starting to be like, all right, Trump has a chance, I'm gonna do it. You know, I think in an election where, you know, if Hillary really had it sewed up for just months and months, um, you know, I think uh, the libertarians would have gotten a lot more votes because people would have been more willing to quote unquote waste their vote, you know, but as the, as the race tightened, I think a lot of conservatives and Republicans said, okay, I can't, if, if Trump's got a chance, I can't have Hillary. So I can't vote for Gary. I'm voting for Trump. So yeah, I, I do know. think that happened. 
you yeah, know? I don't, and I don't think Austin, you know, I know we all love these guys within our little libertarian bubble and the libertarian party, but it's like, I don't see Austin Peterson's appeal to my mom and my dad who didn't like Hillary or Trump. You know what I mean? You know, they can't just, well, who is this Austin Peterson guy? And then they look oh. into him and it's like, oh, well, he's a TV show producer and he's got a great social media presence, but what can he do? Well, you know, is he qualified? Can he actually be president? I guess I just don't really think that a libertarian is going to be president, period. So, sure, I mean, not sure. anytime soon. So to and me, then, yeah. it's more about getting the attention versus getting the vote. And that's why I thought that McAfee would be good, because even though he would be wild and crazy, people would then start looking and digging a little bit further and kind of checking things out. Um, but I understand both both sides. One of the things that I did want to say about Gary, because um, I feel like weird, I'm like, oh, I like Gary, is one of the cool things about Gary was when I saw him last year at Freedom Fest. Are you going to Freedom Fest this year? I am not. What the hell is this crap? All right, fine. I've never I've never been there, and I'm not going to go if they're not paying me to go. I would love Fair to. Enough. I would love to go and do. You know, the Liberty Tour was so fun last year, and a lot of the guys um, that we were on tour with um, during uh, during the last fall. Or at, at, at Freedom Fest every year, but I've never been invited, and uh, I ain't got the money to go on my own. That's why you got to buy my album, and then I can go and do all the libertarian comedy you want. There you go. I like that. I like the I like the plug. Um, so mm -hmm. Jeff Berwick um, was harassing uh, Gary. He came into Gary's nice party, mm -hmm. and he was like all wasted and disruptive, and basically started started shit with Gary and started mm -hmm. just really being very aggressive with him. And Gary got pretty offended and sort of like stalked off. And then Ovens O'Brien, she tried to sort of placate the situation. And what I loved about the way that Gary handled it was apparently he had misunderstood something and, and he went up to Jeff and uh, straight up just went up to him, shook his hand. He said, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize, you know, blah, blah. And I loved that he was able to yeah. acknowledge something that he did wrong and immediately remedy it. And to me, that is the mark of a good man. A oh, good yeah. Man. Like, that's what I want to see is is character. So I really, um, I, I really like that side of him. Definitely a little disappointed in 2016. I don't know what's going to happen in 2020. Who knows if we'll even make it there. Um, but yeah. either way, I'm really glad that you're doing all this comedy. You know, I, I think that comedy is, is sort of like music, right? You kind of get them to laugh. They like you. And then all of a sudden you're like, zing, 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 zing. Sort yeah. of like, um, uh, like, uh, George Carlin, for example, I loved watching all of his, um, old standup routines. Um, do you think that like, what's the political world like in the world of comedy? Because in, you know, music and acting and stuff, everybody's only on the left. Like, do you get pushback for some of your views or do you think that people are more libertarian of the entertainers in the comedian space versus other spaces? Oh yeah. I mean, in terms of art forms, I don't think there's any more uh, libertarian art form than stand up comedy. You know, you look at the battles that Lenny Bruce had to have just on free speech, you know, um, and same with George Carlin with the seven words you can't say on television, you know? Um, I mean, that, libertarian ideals and comedy ideals, and that's why I love Doug Stanhope so much, they really do overlap because it is about the freedom of expression and the freedom of thought and just and being allowed to do that publicly. Um, so, you know, that being said, I definitely say, especially living in New York and, and you look at the other big, the two big comedy hubs are New York and L.A., and of course those are liberal uh, bastions um, with a lot of Democrats and people with liberal ideas. So it is kind of weird to, to see the hypocrisy sometimes a lot of comedians Right where it's like um, you know right right now liberal ideology on the PC side has gotten so out of control that comedians uh, can't go do shows on campuses anymore. Like Jerry Seinfeld, Bill Maher, these are like you know uh, liberal leaning comedians. Obviously, Bill Maher especially, but he is so pissed that, that he can't do college campuses anymore. He even goes on a show. He's like, "What is up with all these snowflakes?" You know, people are chalking Trump's name. On, uh, on 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 college campuses and everyone's freaking out. So it's a uh, it's a very interesting time, I think, in comedy and, and politics and seeing them uh, come together because it is like, all right, well, there's a lot of left leaning comedians, but the ideology of the PC left doesn't exactly overlap with the freedom of expression necessary for comedy to thrive. So um, you know, I I have always liked you know uh, opening for you right at uh, at different libertarian functions because I feel like that is more my crowd. I can make pot jokes, I can swear, and it is kind of funny to think of like, all right, if I ever get 
booked on a Bernie convention because I, I am still sympathetic to the Bernie crowd. Will they let me say whatever I want? <laughs> you know, will they let me talk about drugs? Will they let me swear? We don't know. Um, so I, uh, again, I hope, I hope the libertarian ideals and the cool progressive kids, I hope they all get to just come together and hang out. And then I will totally do that show. Um, I will say on the Liberty Tour last year that we were doing all around the country, uh, we had a lot of Bernie people there. And again, you know, I, I try to keep my, my comments pretty general. You know, I talk about like who here is sick of the war on drugs? Who here is sick of spending hundreds of billions of dollars overseas? Who is sick and tired of the government trying to tell you what you can do with your body? Those are things, if you know, put it in a very general sense, that young progressive Bernie kids and young uh, libertarian kids, all these kids in college that we were talking to, they can all agree. They're like, yeah, I am sick of that. So I always try to keep my, my comedy and my comments pretty general like that. And uh, I think that's what we got to do, marching all the way to 2020, whether it's with the Libertarian Party or if we got to start a fight within the Republicans or we got to start a fight within the Democrats. Um, I'm all about it. And I will, I'm happy to be on the front lines and I will be saying whatever the fuck I want as I do on my hilarious comedy album, Guy from Ohio. Um, so where can people get your hilarious comedy CD and where are you going to be playing again? Like, are you doing any shows? My friend, he goes to the comedy cellar in the city. Um, and he said that Dave Chappelle, God sure. damn, I missed it. Um, well, Dave Chappelle has a, a farm in Ohio. So, um, I love being from Ohio. I love repping Ohio. And it's always so fun for me to remember that Dave Chappelle, who is definitely one of my comedy uh, idols. Um, when I first did comedy, I actually just listened to a, a Dave Chappelle's uh, Killing Him Softly over mm -hmm. and over. And then I realized you know, I did comedy. It was the first time at Ohio University. And I did a bunch of bits about uh, about um, about the dining halls and uh, the the, uh, the dorm rooms and the AOL Instant Messenger because that was still a thing back then. And But I was just talking like Dave Chappelle. I was just a white kid talking like Dave Chappelle. And the yeah. set went really well, but I have to acknowledge that Dave Chappelle was a big part of who I became uh, comedically. And it's just such a cool bonus that he's from Ohio. And uh, he lives, well, he's not from here, but he has a farm here. And he lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio. So uh, I was actually hanging out there. Uh, right after I recorded this album, and I was looking around for Dave Chappelle, and uh, it was so funny because all the little old white old ladies who run all the shops are like, "Oh, Davey, yeah, he comes in from time to time." Um, so you know, New York is is fun, but it, it is it's always nice to remember that Ohio um, is is you know that's why it's the, the swing state. That's why you got to win Ohio to win the presidency. When a comedy bit works in Ohio, whether you're in Cleveland, Columbus, or Cincinnati. Um, then it, it tends to work anywhere, and that's why I love being from here. So the album is on sale. I think we're putting this out on Friday, right? Friday, June tomorrow. 30th. Tomorrow, tomorrow which Friday, June is 30th. today. Today, June 30th, it is on iTunes. Um, physical copies can be ordered from ontourrecords.com. That's the record label who's putting it out. And if you're in Columbus, Ohio, for any reason, we are actually having a party, and you can come get a physical CD. I will sign it for you. I will give you a button uh, that says Calm Down for Jesus, which is a, a song that we put on the album, too. That's right. I also sing Tatiana. we got to do an album sometime together. I like um, that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we had an idea of, of doing a funny uh, album cover one time for you, right, where you were getting first. Wait, what was it? It was you. It was you getting frisked by the TSA, and I was going to be one of the TSA people. Oh yeah, that was a cool album. I still have to do yeah. that album cover, we'll, and I was we'll going to call it, it "For Your Freedoms," and I was going to be getting groped because yeah, that's what they said to me at the TSA. I'm like, thanks yeah, a lot, yeah. Turks. but yeah. it would be hot, right? Because people would be like grabbing me and stuff. But I'd also yeah. like, thank you TSA, right? Um, and I'd be the guy doing some weird and grabby. Um, oh, I, well, thank I can you. look I like a weird TSA guy, so <laughs> um, happy still. Still happy to do that if you need me to. <laughs> um, I have one other question um, before we go, because we're going to bring on Brian in a couple minutes. Um, is what did you think of um, that redheaded chick and the decapitated thing? Kathy Griffin, did you, what did you oh. think of her doing that? Did you think that that was uh, appropriate? Like, did you think that comedy should be pushing those boundaries, or do you think that that is inciting of violence? What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, no, I, I think Kathy, you look, she's a provocateur. She she hasn't been funny for a super long time. She just says, like, racy things and crazy things to get a reaction. And some people within the comedy world do that. And I believe in their right to do that. I also believe in everyone else's right to not like them and to not like that. Um, you know, I don't think she should go to jail for it. I don't think anything like that. But I, I think 
as it went. I think she has the right to be uh, a pr crazy provocateur, and I ha think everyone's got the right to call her whatever they want for doing that. But um, no, I don't think inciting violence and things like that. I, it, it, at the end of the day, you know, it was an attempt to be funny. I think it failed. But in the attempt, we should allow her to do that and allow her to fail. So yeah, that's my just, stance on it. Uh, you know, it, you can't, that's what's so ironic. It's like the Trump people uh, bitch and moan about the PC left being snowflakes and taking offense. And then something like this happens and then they turn into the snowflakes and be like, how dare you do that to my little, my, my favorite president. It's just I like, do, I think that there's a difference between holding a bloody head and saying something mean. I mean, it's I, not its not well, funny, though. It's, that, that's it. You know, it's just she was, I don't know what she was trying to do. She was trying to get a reaction, you know, and she got it. And she also got the negative reaction it deserved. Well, the funniest thing that she did during all of that was her uh, crocodile tear saying, he broke me. Ugh. He broke me. Ugh. But then I so said not, no. I was like, you're a horrible actress. You need to go home and find yeah. a new job. Oh, she's um, definitely a terrible actress. Yeah, probably a terrible uh, person, too. But. I kind of liked her for a while, but I don't know. I'm just uh, like the, the world of entertainment is so stifled right now. It's very frustrating. Um, yeah. But I'm glad that you're breaking boundaries. I'm serious. We got to hang out. I always have such a great time talking with you, and I yeah, really respect your work. So I'll be sure to pick up the new album and uh, and yeah, where do I get it one more time? What's your website? It's on well, it's on iTunes uh, right now. Guy from Ohio. If you go to you're so available uh, as of today, Friday, mm -hmm. June thirtieth, you can get it on iTunes. Um, there'll be mm -hmm. also clips on Sirius Radio and uh, and Pandora and all that stuff because the record label is handling that. If you want to order a physical copy, it's on tourrecords.com. I can uh, send that link to you guys so you can. Uh, We'll put it. it in the show notes, but like I want to buy it directly from you, so then you get yeah. all the money. Oh well, that's yeah. Is well, that's what's nice is uh, I I get three hundred units, um, and uh, they're already in my possession, and I get to keep all of the profits from that. So, um, well, you still so if have. I buy them here, do I get that? If I buy yeah. them on Onto Records, okay, cool. I'm gonna. You, I'm and, gonna I, one of those you and I still we both have August birthdays, right? We're both Leos. Is that? Oh, what maybe was we need to do a dual birthday. When's your birthday? Mine's the eleventh. Mine's the second, so maybe we can do right. like a, a big old the libertarian seventh. shindig on the seventh, um, and we can have like a big old. We can both sell our CDs and all that fun stuff. I really like that idea. Um, yeah. Actually, our next guest, Brian Sovereign, and his beautiful, hyper intelligent, wonderful Stephanie Murphy are thinking about coming down to New York for my birthday. So. I'll, I'll start working on that because I haven't even done a CD release party yet. So maybe we could do a dual yeah. thing. With, it's a little bit short notice, but we've got four or five weeks. So uh, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about that offline and then hopefully our, our New York buds will be able to join us too. Um, but thanks so much for coming on the show. Everybody make sure you support Travis, get his new CD. It's out right now. Well, it'll be out in iTunes and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, listen to the show notes and get some more info. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Tatiana. Always good to see you. Absolutely. Take care. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Golden Stallion. I think that is his name. Um, it is his name, but, you know, I know him just as Brian. Brian Sovereign with the cool uh, Sovereign Superman shirt. What's <laughs> going on, my friend? You look like you're in a basement, like, with, like all, like, tech stuff around you, like wires. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is the dungeon. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I've heard about this dungeon. I heard you have, like, crazy workout equipment. And then you just have like uh, it looks like now now seeing it you've got like a bunch of like techie stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything to uh, to power the mind and the body. So <laughs> very good. Well, I'm very happy to see you. This is a uh, I think your second appearance on the show, and I'm excited for you coming in June July because you and Stephanie are coming, and I'm a really big fan of your Sex and Science Hour podcast because I like sex and I like science and I like them mixed together. Um, and you guys are always uh, giving really, really good advice. So um, it'll be fun to have you on the Tatiana show. I don't really talk about sex on my show uh, or romance or anything, but I like talking about those things. So maybe we'll get a chance <laughs> to talk about that stuff. 
Yeah, um, I mean, who doesn't like talking about that sort of stuff? So yeah, it, that'll be great. I feel like it's everybody's favorite conversation is sex. Like if you've ever gone to a party, everybody gets drunk and then all they want to do is just like talk about sex, 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 sex. If so, they'll admit it, if they'll admit it, you know, usually- Well, the kinds of parties drinks, that I, I go to, we don't have wusses. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we're having you on the show, not because of your uh, sexual prowess <laughs> or, or knowledge. Wait a about minute, you know? no, no. Oh, right. Well, right, I don't know. Show. I mean, I yeah. do know your girlfriend and like you guys are pretty vocal <laughs> on Facebook. Wait, sure. wait, wait, before we move on to the tech stuff, which is not nearly as fun. You recently had a post on Facebook saying, and this like caused like quite the uproar, <laughs> saying that you apologized for your overly sexual content on Facebook, which I enjoy, I think it's hilarious. So tell me what what prompted that and have you changed your position? Um, yeah, so, well, it did create such a storm uh, by so many people, including many women. And I just say that because mainly, I, you know, my reason for wanting to stop with the overtly sexual uh, uh, posts and sharing like all my kind of wild fantasies and everything, you know, mainly had to had to do with that. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. But because so many people are just like, oh, no, 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 I love it. You you man freak, you keep sharing all this stuff, right? Uh, so, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing it. I mean, the, the, the demand is there. Um, so yeah, I was just, you know, I, I had a, I've heard a few people kind of describe things here and there and where it is kind of, I mean, granted, nobody has to read my posts. Nobody has to follow me on Facebook. You know, certainly free speech is a thing. Um, but you're kind of putting out like your fantasies and, you know, who asked for that? Like, like, and, and, and it could just, it, it could be seen as kind of a boundary crossing. Um, also, a lot of times, I mean, you know, my, my posts can be very extreme and uh, I'm not alone in the world. And unfortunately, a lot of people, I mean, well, I don't know. If, I don't know if, if there will be a problem with me saying this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, I mean, like people can't seem to grasp, and I understand why conventionally, culturally, this has sort of always been a thing. But like that, that a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend, or people in a relationship, are often seen as like one person, one brain, one event, one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's ridiculous. You know, I, I I like to think that myself and of course my girlfriend, uh, which you mentioned, the lovely and hyper intelligent Dr. Stephanie Murphy, are two very different people, and we do sometimes have different ideas. Um, but often, like it can color the way that people will perceive Stephanie or something like this. And uh, you know, I, I didn't I didn't necessarily want that to you know really to be a thing anymore. But then even you know Stephanie saw the reaction uh, that was had, and she was like, "Wow, like people just love you." And and so I, I go on and and I continue to make my sexual posts and, and share my wild fantasies and all that and and I have a good time with it because otherwise why be on why why even be on Facebook? You know, I think most people, I think if most people were honest with themselves, the reason that they're really on Facebook, the reason people stick with Facebook is to connect with people. But it's not just to connect with people. I think it's because they want the opportunity to stoop somebody at a conference or, or their next door neighbor or something like that. Uh, I'm not saying that's why I'm on there. I'm just saying that I, you know, I certainly enjoy sharing, you know, kind of getting out this, this, this content that and, and just kind of normalizing talking about sex. Because, I mean, I'm glad at the parties you go to, Tatiana, that people talk about it pretty openly. But more or less around the world, I mean, it's, it's not a very open thing. When I, I really think it, it, it should be. Um, well, apparently I'm not that open-minded because when Stephanie and I were in Anarchapulco, she was holding court and I was just like looking like a little puppy, like all excited. I'm like, what's going to happen next? And, uh, <laughs> and they started talking about pegging. And apparently oh. this is like a rampant thing. And I felt so... Um, like provincial or something. I was like, wait, what? Everybody's pegging? When the hell has this become a thing? <laughs> <laughs> and then on, on another note, I think the reason why you get away with um, the things that you say versus another person is because your love and kind treatment of Stephanie is so apparent. It's a pleasure to see you guys together um, because I think that that's a, a little bit more rare than I'd like in, in our times. So I think well, that, I appreciate that knowing that there's that like love and respect, and then you could say like crazy outlandish things and it's okay because there seems to be this really quite admirable um, interpersonal relationship right there. Um, and like you guys talk a lot about like poly things and to me, when I hear people talking about poly things, I want to shoot myself. I'm like, they're destroying the home. And, and I like monogamy. But because of, you know, your recommendations of sex at dawn and stuff, I've really started looking a little bit differently at my own relationships. And uh, not that I'm switching over to the poly crowd or anything, but I, I do think that it helps me be a little bit more open-minded and 
I guess, you know, shit happens, right? I guess we're cursing on this show. I try not to, even though okay. I'm a sailor. But, um, you know, shit happens. And I, and the reason why I read it was because I wanted to not only, like, if, if someone that I really cared for had a transgression, I want to be able to understand it and not necessarily be so fearful of something like that. And seeing as humanity is like the horniest uh, animal on earth, um, you know, things can go wrong. And I didn't want to be kind of taken aback should something like that happen and have this completely horrible reaction to it. Um, so I thank you for for your um, interesting and thoughtful insights into um, different ways that people interact and, and more acceptable kind of ways of loving. I, I think it's really interesting. I've recommended it. That Sex at Dawn book was so awesome. I recommended it to like 20 people. None of them have read it because they're all lazy, <laughs> but I read it. And now I'm reading yeah, no, Ethical Slut. So I don't know. Not as good, but still cool. Ethical yeah, Slut's more yeah. like a manual. And, and I'm like, why is this girl calling me a slut all the time? So, you know, <laughs> uh, well, a little bit to more term. Yeah. yeah. No, I got it. I got it. It's like taking back the power of the word. Um, yeah, absolutely. But another thing that I, that I you know, adore you for is your ability to explain um, security and, like, I don't know, tech stuff in a way that's that's really accessible. And I think that that's awesome. And now you have a new book out. I didn't even know you were writing a book. Uh, but I picked it up on Kindle the other day. And I haven't read through the whole thing, but I did uh, read especially the intro. And I love your conversational style. And, um, and, and I think that that's what makes it a little bit less intimidating. So tell me a little bit about your background um, for people that aren't familiar with you. And like, how did security become something that's important to you? Sure. Yeah. So the book is uh, Dark Android, um, and it's the no nonsense guide to securing your device and reclaiming your privacy. Um, as far as my background in the entire security space, cybersecurity space, I guess more particularly, uh, I mean, I've always had computers around me, like ever since I was born in 1981. And really, ever since I can't remember a time where there just wasn't a computer in the house. So computers have always been a part of my life. Um, I guess how I got started, and, and this is kind of telling of a book coming out, how I got started with uh, with computers themselves, you know, using computers, was I wanted to write. Like, I really wanted to write. Even before I think I even really knew what writing was, I just, you know, I kind of had the sense that books were just these magical things, you know. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, I mean, I'm not religious now, but at the time growing up religious, you know, books are seen as very magical things. Uh, and just about any religion you look at, or certainly texts are. Um, so I always wanted to write. And so that got me into computers in the first place. And then I had the fortunate... I, I guess, I mean, pure happenstance that I was born at a time or I was growing up at a time when the internet was just coming into the fore, when it was just starting to get into, you know, the average household, uh, which not that this is when the internet started, but I think when it really started to reach into every household and America online and all these things became a thing would have been like, you know, the mid nineties, uh, around there. And so I was able to see that kind of start up and, uh, I remember watching a movie. It was like the first movie I ever got to see on my own. I was so excited. I'm in the mall and it's like, oh yeah, you know, my, and my mother says, yeah, no, you can go see the movie. I don't, I don't really want to see that with you. And I was able to go on my own. I, this is so cool. And the movie is called Hackers. Now the movie Hackers is positively ridiculous. It has like no real showing of I anything. I shouldn't add it to my things to watch. Well, I mean, it's cool to watch. Like, it's still a cool but movie. I still love the movie, but yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Like how it, how it shows hacking, um, you know, quote unquote, is very uh, what they call like cinemagenic, where it's meant to look good on screen, meant to look exciting. It looks nothing like what actual hacking uh, would ever look like. Um, but that movie was very inspirational just because it showed like computers and cool. Like you never really got that before, that computers and coolness were, you know, could be the same thing. And so that was uh, really inspirational to me. And then you just, you know, you, you watch that and then the internet comes on, you, you know, you end up getting in the internet and then you you start looking, you know, I, myself, I started looking into, okay, what is this whole thing about? Like, like how, how, what is this cool factor that I saw in this movie and whatever? And so eventually it led to me, you know, getting involved with various uh, cypherpunk communities in the late nineties. Um, and what's that, a cypherpunk? I saw that on your thing and it sounds so hip and I've heard it before, but how would you describe that movement? What is it? Sure. So cypherpunk, it's an old term and cypher. It's not is, cyberpunk? Not cyber. Cyber is different. So cyber. Is there a difference? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, it's a difference. Sure. So I'll explain that quick. So, and, and oh, it's cool, funny thanks. because I, I put it in my intros and like everybody says cyberpunk and I'm like, well, that, I mean, I'm okay with that too. But, uh, so cypherpunk is a completely like, 
you know, you know real. It's not fictional at all. Uh, uh, cipher meaning like encryption. So you're punk, like you're kind of hip and cool about encryption. And this is a, a term that's been around really since the internet started. Uh, cyberpunk, on the other hand, is a generally is seen as like a fictional genre, uh, like a subgenre of science fiction, like the works of William Gibson, who you know, Neuromancer, uh, or you could think of like movies like Blade Runner. Uh, those would be cyberpunk. Um, but cypherpunk is a totally, you know, real thing, um, and it was very, and particularly that term was used a lot in the late 90s uh, to reference people, and it's still used now. I mean, technically, the Bitcoin community is cypherpunk uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, it has to do with encryption and, and you know, doing cool shit or really deep shit with it. Uh, so that's, yeah, that that's cypherpunk. That's kind of the community I got into. Um, it was very, very anarchistic at the time. Very, one could even use the term libertarian if you wanted to. Uh, but unfortunately, those, the more political, if there is a political stance to cypherpunk, didn't stick with me because in 2002, I ended up joining the, the U.S. Army. Uh, unfortunately, oh. I'm not proud of the fact. So, but in the U.S. Army is also another area where I kind of uh, earned my chops, uh, shall we say, in the tech world and cybersecurity and all of that. Um, but you know, that was a short stint, thankfully, and got out of that, and then ended up working for quite a few different tech companies um, after that fact. Uh, all of which had to either do, you know, either I'd be programming or eventually I'd even get into like sales and all stuff because I could talk that lingo uh, with people. So that's kind of my whole background. Um, and, and, you know, some of the tech companies had did, did contracts with McDonald's, so very serious, uh, you, you know, cybersecurity aspects that, I, you know, fortunately I was able to parlay just a few years later, starting in 2012 with my uh, podcast, Sovereign Tech, and where I could talk to people, you know, and try and break it down to the bare bones to where everybody can understand why. They need cyber, you know, why they need to care about cybersecurity and what they can do about cybersecurity. Um, what do you think is going on right now with the U.S. government and their security? It seems like they keep losing information like a bunch of dopes. And uh, do you know Gary Malefsky? Uh Is that Snoop Wall? Gary Malefsky? Yeah, Snoop Wall. Gary. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm aware of well, him, yeah. He, uh, he was telling me, he was like a big Trump supporter, and he was very concerned that uh, everybody makes the face. Um, he was very concerned about um, the cybersecurity of the U.S. and he wanted to help advise the president if it was Trump. I guess he would advise both, but you know, um, he wanted to advise on how to how to manage that. Do you think that the um, security systems for the United States, in terms of like our computer stuff, is is all messed up or? Can you tell that I know nothing about technology? You know, like <laughs> computers, are they gonna and you know break and stuff? Uh, well, tell me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's kind of I, I think this is important to bring up is that or at least I mean this is somewhat theory, but I think that there are like multiple different gangs, and I don't just mean like Republican and Democrat. I think there are multiple different gangs within what we would call the U.S. government. And some of those gangs, like say CIA would be one gang, NSA would be one gang, and they are gangs. They're you know they're armed thugs. Yeah, totally. Um, no, no doubt about it. Right. Um, you know, and even like the Trump administration, all these things, they're all different gangs. They're all different groups, and each one of them has varying degrees of competency. I think um, as as far as cybersecurity goes, uh, the U.S. Mm -hmm. government you know, in general, like maybe the Trump administration or the House of Representatives, the Senate, stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's a mess. Like they, they, they really have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're legislating about. They have really no idea what they're, you know, what they're really doing. Um, I mean, eventually they seem to listen to people, for example, during the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, you know, the campaign, you know, the organizers and all that, eventually they finally figured out, especially with her email scandal, well, gee, we should be using uh, the Signal app, which is one of the gold standards of, uh, you know, mobile communications that are encrypted. Um, and so, I mean, they, they can kind of get on board with this sort of thing, but it, it's really a mess. And, and, you know, the thing is, is that it's not like the only, like if I was Gary Malevsky, okay, and I, and I don't know the guy very well, but whatever. Anyway, if I were say, say I was just, I was like uh, somebody that was an advisor, um, you know, to 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 the Trump administration or something. Not that I would ever do that. Um, you know, well, anyway, I, I could crack a joke, but that's fine. Um, I would, you know, I'd be saying to them, the only way to really secure information is not to collect it. Like you just can't collect it. Like there was that recent leak uh, that you probably heard about. It's something 198 million uh, voters. You know, all of the information that they gave, and granted, it was from 2012. Um, but you know, it all got it, or potentially somebody if they just knew the right 
web address, the right URL, they could get collect tons of information about these voters. Now, the only way you That's can really so many people, two hundred oh, yeah. million. Yeah, yeah. That's like yeah. the two thirds of the country. Right. <laughs> so Holy first, cannoli. Yeah. So first off, obviously, voting is bad for you. Okay, <laughs> because you know you're giving up this information. Uh, but wait, I don't uh, think we have two hundred million people voting. By the way, I, I whatever. Anyway, continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regardless of how that how that shapes up, but uh, anyway, you know, the only way really to keep that from happening is is really to i mean there are the only way to really secure it is to just not have the information there i know people want to talk about all these different uh, uh technologies and well we could put it behind this firewall we could do you know this 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 or we could put it on a blockchain which honestly that's the worst recommendation i'd ever heard in my life um but really why you know, Oh, well, so first off, blockchains are, you know, like securing things through blockchains. Uh, the main argument for securing on a blockchain usually comes down to the fact that they're immutable, mm -hmm. um, but they're not immutable. You, one can just look at Ethereum and you can see that, no, actually the, the developers can go ahead and change things however the hell they want. Um, you know, if they don't like a certain what, what, is, what isn't accurately a theft, like consider the DAO situation that happened. Um, if you don't like where somebody's money went, then the developers can just rewrite things. So there's no real security there, uh, you, you know, in, in putting things on, on a blockchain because the dev team can just change their mind and rewrite history how they see fit. Um, Do you not so consider that a theft? Sorry to jump in, but I, sure. I noticed that kind of popped out because the whole thing with the Ethereum DAO, whatever, blah, blah, was that the person exploited a fault in the code. So they didn't actually... Well, it wasn't it, a like, didn't they take advantage of something that was written improperly? It wasn't a, well, this is the thing, is it wasn't really a fault in the code, it's how the code was written. Um, and right, so the, that's what I meant, but the clarification. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so all they did, they followed the rules. They didn't, like, if, if theft is the breaking of some kind of rule or, or law or something like that, they didn't do any of that. They, 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 they just, they, yeah, they, they took advantage of this loophole but that's all it was, you know. So it's not. I mean, even uh, uh, and 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 if I'm misquoting him, I, I apologize. Even Anthony Diorio, who is obviously a big name in Ethereum, uh, you know, he said, "No, this wasn't a theft. You know, it, it's the way it was designed." Um, I mean, people could, yeah, people lost money, but again, there, there's a difference between losing money and theft. Um, this was not technically dictionary definition of theft. Um, uh -huh. I'm not saying. That, I mean, I still think it's a terrible thing honestly, that that happened. Um, and myself on my own show, Sovereign Tech, I've been warning ever since Ethereum started. I said, no, this is a terrible idea. You don't want something that has, you know, there's a reason Bitcoin was, you know, like uh, one of the major selling points for Ethereum is that it's Turing complete. Um, I call that tur Turing vulnerable, not Turing complete. The reason Bitcoin is kind of limited and why Bitcoin can't do so much of what Ethereum does say uh, is because it was designed that way. But I think the design was actually a security feature. It was keep it limited so that way that kind of BS, like with the DAO or whatever else, wouldn't be a part of the program, wouldn't be something that happens. Uh, so, you know, these limited feature sets as compared to Ethereum, which can supposedly do anything, I think the limited feature set is actually the far more attractive route to go. Uh, you know, you don't want this 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 rampant ability to do anything, uh, you know, on there. I mean, you want to be able to do that, but you, you should be kind of... Uh, uh, separating it to where there's like multiple say if you're doing it in, in, with blockchain technology you want multiple blockchains that could that could each one does a different thing you don't just want one blockchain that can do it all because that's a central point of failure um i mean and you can see that too also like the, did you see the story where uh there was like a fake news site that said vitalik buterin died in oh yeah i heard about this uh-huh right so that happens and the Ethereum price tanks. I mean, it was tanking for other reasons as well, but that was certainly like a huge nosedive. Um, that, that's a problem when, when a technology relies, like a technology's value seems to completely rely upon a single individual's, you know, whether or not they're alive or dead. Uh, I mean, that that's, you know, I mean, like Satoshi Nakamoto, the best thing that, that Satoshi, whoever, whatever that is, uh, you know, did was completely walk away from Bitcoin because now Bitcoin can survive on its own merits. That's where with Ethereum. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure that it can survive on its own merits. Can it exist without the Church of Vitalik? You know, it, it's kind of a. I mean, it's a very scary, you know, you know, prospect. Um, and so, wanting to take technologies like that and, and toss them onto everything else that we do, say with government and voter collection and all this different stuff, uh, whew, I'm very skeptical of, of of doing a lot of that. Yeah, that sounds a little bit intimidating. Are there? Um, 
Are there cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin that you like to recommend? Because I've been thinking about diversifying lately um, and you've been giving me a little bit of advice um, on what you think, you know, has some has some legs. Uh, you tell me, what do you think is exciting right now in the crypto space? Sure. So Zcash definitely. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it. I see it coming. I got yeah. a page on the show to talk about it. Let's, yeah. let's write that down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, she's great. Uh, but yeah, Zcash is definitely uh, kind of on the top of my list as far as, and mainly because, um, and I'll mention a couple others, but but mainly because it really does do something that Bitcoin doesn't do. That Bitcoin Bitcoin could have done because originally Zcash was Zcash is based off the concept of zero knowledge proofs, which just in, in layman's terms means you can't see where a transaction is going, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you don't know what, what the money's doing. How is, is that a proof of something happening if you can't tell what happened? Well, it's a proof because you 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 can prove that this anonymous transaction occurred, but you have no knowledge of what the transaction was. So okay. and, and that that's that's really like you know, and I love the fact that it has the, it has the term cash in it instead of coin because when you think of cash, I mean cash is one of the ultimate anonymous monies. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, there's there's serial numbers on it and all that. I understand that, but I mean, certainly cash gets used for you know, if the argument is against cryptocurrencies, well, people just use it to buy drugs. Well, newsflash: uh, most drugs in the world are bought with the U.S. dollar. Uh, so you know, I mean, are you going to ban that? Of course not. Uh, but I like that factor. You know, I, I like the fact that. Um, you know that there's this anonymous money because I think for money to really be totally valid, uh, you should be able to to spend it privately. Uh, but I mean, originally, you know, this concept of zero knowledge proofs was supposed to be or was being uh, offered uh, as it was at the time it was called zero coin to be baked into uh, Bitcoin. And I've always been a little very conspir well, not a little very conspiratorial over the fact that nobody ever wanted to do that, like that the development team for Bitcoin wasn't interested in making that happen. So I'm glad that it exists in some form now because it is such a brilliant idea. Uh, and that is Zcash. So so that that one's certainly exciting to me. Um, we have to have Zuko on. Why didn't I, yeah. I met him. He's so cool. We hung out yep. in uh, in Argentina. And uh, and I never did that either. I'm getting all these good show ideas. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Zuko's a good guy too. So, so uh, can normal people use Zcash? Like I'm handicapped when it comes to this stuff. Tell me, how do I use Zcash? Sure. So Zcash. Uh, well, we we. So here here's kind of one of the challenges with Zcash is that there's not a lot of the, like the the Zcash the company that develops Zcash which is like the Zcash electric company or something. It's a really cool name. Um, they, they don't spend a whole ton of time working on the user interface. They don't spend time really working on wallets or anything like that. You know, they work on the client, they work on zero knowledge proofs. They, I think this is very smart of them. They put, you know, they put the bulk of their, as I understand it, the bulk of their development time and team working on making like the core code really great. Okay, uh, but everything else that gets done with Zcash, you know, the community has to step up to do that. And so right now, you know, a lot of like wallets and all these things and all these like more practical ways to use Zcash are still being largely developed. And, and understand Zcash has only been, I don't even think it's been out for a year, uh, right. you know, as, as far as like its official release. So, so I don't think that's so much of a bad thing. Um, but Jack's wallet can accept it, but you want to be careful with Jack's. Um, Why? You know, Why do I want to be careful with Jack's? So with the Jax wallet, you recently there was a and and the the exploit, the supposed hack and the supposed theft of a lot of Ethereum out of a Jax wallet. It is not proven that the problem was actually the Jax wallet, this exploit that's about to be described. Um, there oh, wow. is the ability within the Jax wallet to supposedly within like if you are connected, if say I'm the malicious uh, actor. You know, I'm, the, I'm the, the hacker. I don't like to use that term for somebody that does bad things. I think hackers are heroes. But let's say I'm the hacker. I'm trying to get uh, some Ethereum that's on your Jax wallet. What I need to, all I need to do, and I make that sound simple. It's really not that simple. But I need to be on the network that your machine is connected to, your device is connected to that has your Jax wallet. And within 20 seconds of me, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying, within 20 seconds of that, I could get into your Jax wallet and I could uh, cause a transfer of whatever you happen to have in that Jack's wallet to you know other addresses, and then potentially I could do a theft. Um, now, 
that that's not I, I it sounds very simple that's a little harder to do than most people you know really think and there might even be ways to mitigate that by like requiring a pin number to do to transfer away from your wallet and jacks but the jacks development team themselves have been saying please only use jacks as a hot wallet meaning you know don't put crazy amounts of money inside of this um and that until in the future when they come up with uh like sec second factor authentication uh modes and methods for Jax to to just continue to use it as a high wallet and it's unfortunate because Jax is you know talking about zcash it's like one of the only mainstream um wallets that allows for uh holding zcash that has a zcash wallet built into it granted it's it's what i mean zcash kind of has like two different wallet types they have what's called transparent which means it's not encrypted and then they have uh, shielded which means it is encrypted the jacks wallet can only do transparent um you know transactions and have a transparent wallet but it's a shame because i think a lot of people the way that they get their hands on a lot of altcoins, a lot of these other cryptocurrencies outside of Bitcoin is by using the Jax wallet because it is so, uh, you know, it, it's it's so cross-platform, they have it for any device and it can accept so many different currencies. Uh, but yeah, right now, the, the warning from the Jax team themselves is only use it as a hot wallet. Do not use it to store, you know, anything. Yeah, but I can't keep like my Zcash anywhere. Where am I gonna keep it? Well, so that's the thing. Now there's- well, You're a like, sorry, nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> so, okay. So there is, um, there's actually, I think his name's David Mercer. He's actually, uh, I, like, I really appreciate his development work. Um, and he, you know, he's independent and he's just for the love of Zcash. Um, he's made Zcash for Mac, which I think is at Zcash, the number four Mac.com. And then he's also made Zcash for win, same thing, Zcash number four win.com and those are zcash wallets that you can install onto your computer they have a very nice graphic user interface because normally when you when you know when you install a zcash wallet um like say on linux or on ubuntu which is the the only thing that's officially supported um right now anyway is you have to use uh you know the like the, the command line you're going to be typing out everything gets done in text and all this um so those are those are two of the better better options out there for having Zcash is if you have a Windows computer or if you have a Mac, um, you know, then then use Zcash for Mac or Zcash for Win. Uh, I mean, it, it's a limitation, no doubt about it. And I certainly don't recommend leaving this stuff on exchanges. Uh, but again, this is very new. And and as more utility and more necessity is seen for, for using Zcash, I think that, uh, you know, I think other great wallet solutions will end up coming out. Yeah, I think that people will probably add to it. Um, what about this IOTA thing? I've been hearing about it. Josh, I'm, again, I'm so sad he's not with us. He's like going crazy over it. He's like, I love it. It's the best thing ever. I'm like, all right, simmer down there, Buster. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on IOTA? I wanted to maybe see about having those guys on here. Sure. So IOTA is like this coin, this blockchain, more specifically, you know, to address um, Internet of Things, which is something that a lot of blockchains have been. I mean, IBM has been working on this. They have their own blockchain called Adept. Um, and, and I think this now, I mean, I'm not an expert on IOTA. I haven't even, you know, dug too deep into the white paper and whatever else. Uh, but myself, you know, and, and again, t talking as a cybersecurity guy and a guy that's written a book about security and all that, uh, I didn't put this in the book, but boy, I, I should have maybe at least put a paragraph in there. Uh, you know, if you want any kind of security, like run away, run away so fast from anything that is Internet of Things, any of these smart devices and all this, you don't want any of it. You don't want your washer to be smart. You don't want your refrigerator to be smart. You don't want any of this nonsense um, because all of it, you know, well, there, there's a bunch of reasons why this is a thing, um, but all of it is really a gateway into the rest of your life. Now, attaching blockchains like something like IOTA to to the Internet of Things is kind of a necessity because it is collecting so much information about you, and because it does need to do it in a long term long term storage, uh, you know, kind of way. Because I mean, you're not supposed to, you know, when most people buy a washer and dryer or something that's connected to the internet. Uh, now, but I mean, but in general, when most people buy a washer and dryer, I mean, they expect it to last them 20, 30 years. You know, nobody's, it's not like a cell, a smartphone where you're buying a new one every year or every two years or something like that. Uh, so you need some kind of long-term storage for a lot of these Internet of Things devices that are powering your entire house potentially. And I think, uh, you know, blockchain technology certainly can can really help out with that. But in my opinion, just in general, we don't want Internet of Things. Like it's just a terrible freaking idea, you know, in general. So IOTA, I get it. I, I imagine there's gonna be a use case because Silicon Valley is, is really thrusting upon people whether they want it or not. 
they are thrusting upon people, you know, the internet of things, uh, devices. So you know, it helps the NSA, they're little buddies. Exactly, right. Yeah, well, you hit it. I mean, that, <laughs> you know, um, so so I think that's why IOTA is so exciting because I think a lot of people see Internet of Things to be like just a, a, a like it's just going to be a part of life and there's nothing you can do about it. Just like today, you know, try and buy a TV that doesn't connect to the Internet now. Um, it's it's nearly impossible. You know, you have to buy a computer monitor pretty much. You can't even buy just a stock TV anymore. They all come with Roku built in or Amazon, uh, you know, the Fire TV or something or even Android TV or whatever they'll have built into it. Uh, it's nearly impossible. So this is really being put on you. So I agree that blockchain can be used to kind of secure that, but the whole market category, in my opinion, just shouldn't exist. And it's just like, the it's one of the worst ideas in human history. Uh, but, oh that's well. Quite a, that's quite a statement. Um, <laughs> Should I be afraid of my Fitbit that I just got? It's probably an Internet of Things monster of some kind. I mean, my phone's spying on me all day long. Can I know how many steps I did? Well, that's the. Th I mean, that actually, you you brought up a great point. I mean, and that is, is that anybody that has these concerns over privacy and all that, um, if you have a smartphone in, with you, I mean, it's just a block of sensors, some odd twenty to thirty sensors, depending upon your phone, um, that's tracking everything you do pretty much at all times. I mean, there's a reason that you know they're fairly large milliampere batteries inside of them run out so quickly, and it's because it's collecting and sending so much information about you. Uh, so that's certainly a concern. But I mean, like with a Fitbit, so the the, the unique thing where I would argue maybe against a Fitbit and not so much against a smartphone. Um, Fitbits have been used in a lot of these health trackers in general. You know, they have been used in the court of law uh, either to prove or disprove a case. Um, and, and I, and it's bad because I think even like Fitbit data is, it's already been proven that it's not a good sleep tracker at all. Uh, in fact, it can't tell the difference between whether or not you're sleeping or if you're at the local, you know, discotheque or something, you know, doing a dance. Uh, so, I mean, they're really inefficient, but then at the same time, like, you know, the government considers them valid data to be used against you in a court of law. I mean, whether it's to prove your innocence or to prove somebody's guilt, uh, you know, giving more avenues for the government really to, to to point fingers at you in any way, shape, or form, I think is a, is is a very scary idea. So uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't wear a Fitbit. I mean, I do wear a watch, but it's not a smart watch at all or anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, so that's something to consider. But you're crushing my hopes and dreams, Brian. I hate. <laughs> I don't care what you have to say. You know, I heard that Sex and Science Hour episode about how Fitbits and and like these walking trackers they don't even do anything but but they make me feel like I'm a good person they may want to like move so I like <laughs> it I like knowing what my heart rate is you know I do some jumpy jacks I'm like oh man it's at 132 come on girl keep going like even if it's an illusion but now knowing that they're being used in a court of law I mean well I, I mean at the same time, whatever makes you feel good. You know, I mean, I'm an absolute hedonist. I am all about I hate the government. I don't want them spying <laughs> on me. That doesn't make me feel good. I have like two sides of myself. It's like the, the cookie monster and then the vegetable monster. They're like fighting each other. And it's like the same thing. I hate the government, but I love my Fitbit. Damn it. Yeah. Um, so how do I keep, uh, I'm, I'm on an iPhone um, and your book is for Android. So am I screwed or what? Should I no. just switch over? Because I bought, um, what do you call it, like a Galaxy at one point. I wanted to blow it up myself. I was very, very <laughs> angry. I didn't like it. I wanted to throw it out my window and like terrorize it. Um, and uh, and then I returned it. So uh, what's the story? Do I need to get off the iPhone? Am I, am I totally screwed? And also, I don't want to spend four hours learning how to secure my phone. Like, I don't want to be a computer programmer. I just want to use my signal and then have that be my happy place and, and then call it a day. Um, sure. what do I do? So, okay. So first off, like, I mean, my book, Dark Android, a lot of what's in it, uh, and the explanations as well as some of the app recommendations are just as valid for iOS as they are for Android. Um, it's a book with a lot of screenshots. So, and those screenshots, you know, address Android and that's why it made sense really to title it for Android. But I think anybody with any kind of mobile device, be it a tablet or whatever, really could take advantage um, of, of what's in there. Like talking about Signal, uh, talking about PGP and how PGP works. In fact, I had some very kind people say that uh, they felt that I explained PGP, you know, like the best they've ever heard an explanation for it, which I'm, I'm really honored by that. Uh, but a lot of these different technologies, you know, they all exist within the book. You don't have to leave iOS because honestly, you know, with a lot of the leaks, you know, you have the Vault 7 leaks, 
um, what we found out from Snowden. I mean, all these different things that happen. Really, you find out that Apple is actually doing a hell of a job as far as security goes. I mean, and, and at least with their own devices. Um, one can make different arguments about you know their software that they offer on other platforms. But uh, Apple really does, does do as good a job as any company can. Uh, so I don't think you really have to switch away from Apple at all. Um, unless you really want to get like really knee deep in having a lot of control over what you do. Uh, I mean, Apple still collects everything about you and it's just a matter of really trusting, you know, do you trust Apple that much? Uh, to some degree, I mean, that, that kind of comes down to the whole argument around privacy is, you know, can you even have privacy? But then at some point you're trusting some company and so which company do you trust the most? You know, like that, that's almost what the argument can, can, could come down to. And my book starts off with, you know, in Dark Android, it actually starts off with turning off so many of the collections that Google makes, uh, you know, of you, you know, how much data it collects about you, your history, and all of these different things. Um, because, you know, certainly I, I, I would trust, if, you know, somebody had to really pin me down about it, I would trust Apple way before I would trust Google. Uh, I mean, just in, you know, in a heartbeat. Um, so that's kind of how the book starts. I mean, you're actually, you're kind of winning if you have Apple in a way because you don't really have to have a Google account in that case. As to where I have to start off with my book with, okay, you have a Google account, here's how we turn everything off in this Google account. Um, and the book itself is designed for really, I mean, because so Sovereign Tech, my show, I like to think it's designed for everybody, but I understand there's different levels of technical knowledge, obviously. Uh, some people are at the high level, you know, say there are 10, um, and then there's people who are like at a one, you know, um, my book is definitely designed for, you know, one being the, the least technically knowledgeable. Uh, my book is designed for maybe like the one to the fives, you know, this is for really everybody. And even if you're like in the five to tens, like you're a really knowledgeable tech person, it might be good to get a, you know, brush up on the basics. Um, or there's other things that I describe in there that maybe, you know, people just, you know, even the tech savvy, uh, didn't know about. Um, so I break down all of that, what apps to use, how they work, why they work, why you want this privacy. Um, and I talk about quite a bit like, you know, using different browsers, getting away from that, like uh, using Firefox. It's one of the most, you know, I, I have a whole chapter on using Firefox on Android. And why? Because Firefox is bad or Firefox is great? Because it's great. Now, Firefox is not I'm on great. Chrome right now on my, wait, wait, time out. Before we okay. move on, I'm on my MacBook. Yep. I'm on Chrome. Should I be hanging out on Firefox? No, no. So yeah, so this is this okay, is kind of a point that now. Yeah, <laughs> this this is kind of the point I bring up in in the book. Well, two things. One is, I mean, just for you know to fully surround the subject, uh, Firefox come the end of 2017 on desktop is going to be a completely different browser. Like they're changing it from the ground up. Um, so might not be the best time to be jumping on Firefox on desktop anyway. But regardless, right now. You know, speaking right now, Firefox is not the greatest experience on a desktop. It it, it just isn't. Um, so you know, if people are using Chrome or in the MacBooks case, or using Safari or something like that, by all means, you know, use those because Firefox really, in my opinion, isn't offering any advantages right now. Uh, but on Android, and particularly on Android, uh, Firefox is, I mean, like you know, it's a uh, I can't think of the term, but it's like a life raft just being tossed out to you on, on a very crazy ocean um, be, for a few different reasons. I mean, one of them is, is that uh, it uses, uh, I guess for in basic terms, it uses a different security suite than the entire, uh, than the entire operating system of Android does. So if, you know, you hear about a lot of different, a uh, lot of different malware and a lot of different exploits that happen for Android, like there's um, uh Stage fright. There's been a few diff different ones over the past couple of years that have been really huge. Um, if you used Firefox, Firefox would have actually been separated from being affected by by stage fright and some of these other exploits. So, I mean, just on a security angle, it's a far superior web browser to use. Um, also, it has uh, it has extensions which you probably use on Chrome. You know, it's like an ad blocker and things like this, which Android doesn't offer natively. Um, iOS does now offer like ad blockers, and I think ad blockers are so important because a lot of malware gets sent to people because of ads. You know, and I know a lot of people have have concerns over oh, I don't want to use, you know, I don't want to use an ad blocker because then my favorite news organizations can't get paid. And I say the same thing every time that argument comes up. That is their problem. That is that news sites, that is that website's problem to figure out how they get paid. That is not your problem. Your, your only problem 
is to make sure that you're you're secure, that you, that you're using best practices, and that your devices are secure. Um, you know, let let the New York Times figure out how the hell they're going to get paid. I mean, that's just that's that's not for you to be to be worried about, in my opinion. So uh, so that's you know that's a good reason to use Firefox is the extensions and just the entire security makeup of the browser itself. Can Mac people on an iPhone use a Firefox browser or no? And would it have the same effect or it doesn't matter? No. So that's one of the problems with iOS. And this is where you kind of lose choice. Um, like every web browser more or less has to be based off of like Safari. So you can't actually, Firefox has a browser for Safari or for uh, iOS called Firefox Focus, which is this very privacy focused um, web browser, but it's really designed to be used when you want to do private browsing. It's not I don't feel like it's designed to be used like all the time, um, mm -hmm. but I would totally recommend use Safari instead of Google Chrome because at least then Safari, uh, you know, isn't sending all of the, your entire web history and everything you do off to Google. As to where if you use Google Chrome, that's exactly what happens. So you do have, even though you can't really use Firefox, you do have the option of using Safari, which is great. Random question. What's your favorite um, search engine? Ooh, DuckDuckGo. Um, yep, there's a whole chapter. Yeah, I've been Google. using it, but they suck so bad. It's not as good <laughs> as Google. Google's so easy. They show me little pictures of what I want. Oh, man, so, I've been using DuckDuckGo, and they're, like, jerking me around. I'm like, come on, step it up, guys. Yeah, okay, so so DuckDuckGo, I have actually have a whole chapter also on DuckDuckGo um, in the book. Uh, because I think it's it's equally it's a very important thing to to use for for a variety of reasons. Not only because it can search Tor, uh, but but there's there's other other advantages as well. Um, yeah, it, it's not as good as Google. That's a fact. But the reason that Google is so good at what it does is because it's spying on you. Exactly, it's consistently it's like tracking it. your interests and everything that you do. And so yeah, DuckDuckGo by nature, because of its privacy centric nature, really can't be as good as as Google Search. But then you know, it's security and convenience. Do you want security? Which I think privacy and security are really kissing cousins. Like they're, they're you really can't have one without the other. Um, you know, do you want the security or and the privacy, or do you want the convenience? And that's the question everybody has to ask themselves. And you know, I'm not saying that one is necessarily less valid than the other, but that's the question you have to ask. Man, this is so overwhelming. <laughs> How? Why My don't you find this overwhelming and scary? Like, why isn't this stuff? terrorize you it like it does me you know just we're just having this conversation i feel like who's coming for me you know <laughs> it's very <laughs> paranoia inducing and then there's also a part of me that's like glazing over that's like i don't care anymore <laughs> so like is it just like suck it up buttercup you know you want to run in a marathon you can't do it if you're just going to take like a two minute walk around the block like you just have to barrel through it or, or what do you think yeah, so I mean, definitely part of this is that it's hard, you know. Like, I mean, yeah, installing Signal and all that stuff and rocking it out. I mean, that that that's pretty easy, and that's probably why it's so popular. Um, but I mean, to like to really do this right and and to really you know set a lot of the stuff. I mean, my book, you know, just just kind of sc scratches the. Well, there's there's a Stephanie Murphy phrase: scratches the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> you know, like I mean, it's just scratching the surface um, of of what, you know, what, how far one can go, you know, to like really get this privacy and security and all this in the world today. Um, and yeah, I mean, to, to go all the way, it really is hard, but the point, you know, really the one thing you can do, and, and I've said this, in fact, I, I, I gave a, a few talks at, at Porkfest. Um, they were year. so well attended, by the way, everybody should have uh, been there because apparently it was a full house and there was standing room that needed to be filled. Yeah, but I heard yeah. they were really good as well. So uh, sorry to interrupt. Continue. No, that's all right. No, thanks. But I mean, but the point I brought up is that, look, if you're targeted, like if, th if there's a manhunt going on for Tatiana Moroz, Tatiana Moroz is screwed. Like, I mean, like, you know, you, there's nothing, or even me, you know, if, if there, if, if it was like a manhunt situation, we want this guy, you're, you're done. There's nothing you can really do, you know, uh, to, to like, to completely evade, uh, you know, that, that's that kind of, that kind of search. Um, and some people feel that that's a very defeatist view, but really, you know, all we can do with setting up all of these different security practices is a, you can keep the run of the mill person, you know, or your, your average everyday, you know, quote unquote hacker hanging out in Starbucks from, you know, taking over your life, uh, or, you know, uh, uh you know, taking over your digital life anyway, which directly affects your physical life, or you can make it expensive 
for the varying alphabet soup organizations and governments around the world. And I think both of those are very valid pursuits uh, you know, to, to go for, because once you get them in place, yeah, it takes a little while to set it up, but once you get them into place, I think it creates a, a very uh, a privacy-centric, freedom-centric mindset uh, in a person, and, and it, it just it starts to, I think, show benefits throughout your entire life. Um, that you that you don't even recognize initially, uh, you know, because maybe you're just so concerned about how hard it's going to be or how much time it's going to take to set all this different stuff up. Um, but and also understand it's not just about you. Like the more the more everybody secures their devices, the better off everybody is. The better off we are from having uh, like the wanna cry ransomware attack happening, um, you know, and all this different stuff. I mean, it, it really, you know, not that I mean. You know, think about yourself. I'm, I'm totally about being, you know, self-centered and all that. That's fine. But understand that you you setting this stuff up helps everybody, and helping everybody else set it up also helps you in the long run. Like it secures you. The more secure everybody else is. Um, are you gonna give your pork vest talk in any other format? Because I feel like um, maybe. So did you do hand holding there? Because we it was weird at pork fest because me and Lynn we're basically completely pitted against you. Like we were just, that yeah. was the whole thing. <laughs> they kept scheduling was, us around it. Yeah. yeah, which was frustrating because um, I really wanted to see your talk because I think you like walk people through and Paige Peterson helped you and, or or do I have a completely wrong story on this? Well, so yeah, so there was like a third talk that I gave that was supposed to be a workshop after my main talk. It ended up not, your, your description of what it was supposed to be is accurate. Uh, oh, but okay. It, it ended up people just kind of like gathered around me like Jesus and and started uh, you know just asking questions from the Holy One. No, I'm kidding. I mean, yeah, I mean that is kind of how it went, but I don't see myself in that way. Uh, you know, even though I'm a Jew in my 30s, but uh, so anyway, but uh, yeah. So, but but I did. Yeah, um, I, I use that joke all the time. So I was waiting ever since I was a I'll, kid. I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, you know, happy to like uh, participate. Anyway, continue. yeah. Ever since I was a kid, I was like, all right, when I get in my 30s, I can say I'm that 30 year old Jew telling people what to do. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, my talks, two of my talks, I didn't record because I thought it was going to be a workshop, right? Uh, so I didn't record that one, but I did independent recordings of both of my other talks. One of them, which was a uh, a talk on mesh networking, which is an important uh, technological development. Um, I did that with Paige Peterson and Ryan Taylor, uh, and I well, then Ryan, I had my cool peeps. Yeah, the, just some of the best wow. in the world. Woo! Uh, so, and then I had uh, uh, I had my main talk. In both of those, if you become a patron of Sovereign Tech on Patreon. Uh, which you can just go to SovereignTech.com to become a patron. And it's only like a dollar a month. That's all I ask. If people want to do more, that's great. Uh, but I have put both of those talks um, up there on, on Patreon. But you got to be a patron to get access to them. So, I am a patron. You are. So you can so check I gotta it out. I got to go and look at it. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I like that. You know, I think um, either you should do a workshop course, like as like a companion piece to the book. Mm -hmm. Wait, are you guys doing an audio book to, the, to, the, um, to your book? Yeah, I will be doing an audiobook of Dark Android. The only thing is, it's going to be, I mean, because it is a lot of screenshots, I think it's going to end up kind of weird, but I'm going, I to, agree. I'm going to make it work. Well, you know what the other alternative would be is like, I think that if you did your workshop as a video class, like I would pay to attend that class. You know, not only could you give it away for free, which would be very nice, but like I actually think that you could have people pay to do some sort of a course. So um, what's on the horizon? Is anything like that on the horizon? I, I heard rumbles of another book. What's what's the plan? Yeah, so uh, so doing like a video course for Dark Android is something I've actually, uh, I've thought about for some time. Um, part, part of the problem, like admittedly this book, you know, this book is valid right now. And honestly, a lot of what's in it will really be valid for all time uh, based upon what it describes. But you know, th these like mobile, you know, there's a new version of Android every year. I mean, and security itself is always a moving target, especially cybersecurity. It's a moving target almost by the second. Oh, so this yeah. is a book where new versions are really going to probably have to come out every year. Um, you know, and that's why it's Dark Android 2017 edition, because I know there's just, there's going to have to be updates because there's going to be things that change. Um, sure. So the amount of time it takes to produce a video and all that, uh, it's very tough, I think, to keep that timely and what subject matter to stick into. So it's something I'm thinking about, but, uh, you know, like it, it, it takes a lot of thought. I think there's a reason that really nobody else has done it because it is such a, it's, it's something tough to keep current and to keep valid. Um, as to Could where a book, you, you can refresh. Go ahead. 
Well, could you do some sort of like a, like a three minute um, PGP, three minutes on this or three minutes on that? Or is that not accept like, is that not realistic? No, I think something also, like that. Also, it probably takes work. longer than three minutes will be hard. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I think it's I think it's great. You know, we were going to do a little security um, brush up with me, but I think maybe I'll read the book. Um, and then this way, even though it'll be painful and annoying, at least it'll be coming from you, which is not as painful and annoying. Like to me, anything technologically related, <laughs> unless I'm thinking of it in terms of creative application, makes me fall asleep within seconds. Like it's forget ambient. This is what I go to. But <laughs> I, I do think that you have an entertaining way to talk about it. And I think that it brings a certain sense of security and empowerment once you do take the time to learn this stuff. And um, in, and then you could kind of go out and evangelize and get more of your friends and family to kind of uh, pay attention to this because it can be very devastating. You know, I've had friends lose, you know, oodles and oodles of Bitcoins and it is yeah. miserable. And, you know, when, when Lynn had that hack, holy yeah. And only that was horrible. I mean, they went through hell that family, and it was so difficult to get things back online. I mean, it was it was quite terrifying. So, um, I really recommend everybody get your book, Dark Android 2017 version. Um, do you yeah, have I mean, any other words for everybody? Because I I was also going to say maybe people should check out your podcast, Sovereign Tech, and it, Sex and Science Hour is on a break right now, right? Yeah, I think we'll be back this week, but I, you know, I don't have 100% control of, of Sex and Science Hour like I do with Sovereign Tech. So Sovereign Tech comes out every Saturday, a uh, new episode, two hours at least. <laughs> Some of them have been a lot longer because there's so many crazy things going on in the tech world today. Uh, but yeah, I mean, and as far as the dark Android book, like, I mean, if, even if a person is averse to reading and all that, uh, the pictures come up very quickly. Like my introduction, in fact, I made it a point. I made it just for people like you, Tatiana, where the introduction is one page. And like that's, that's why it. I like that. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, it actually doesn't come up on one page. It comes up over several on my the way that I'm reading it. But oh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, short. It was sweet. It didn't scare me. It had some jokes, had your wonderful, charming personality. So I really applaud your work. I'm a big fan. And um, I don't know. I'm really glad that you come on and we'll see you uh, in July. Hopefully Josh will be able to join us and uh, and maybe even in August with Travis. I'm, I'm getting right on that. As soon as we get off this call, I'm going to be like, all right, when am I doing this party? Yeah, so, party. Um, so thanks very much for coming on. I wanted to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, uh, libertycraze.com. I haven't talked about them yet. They made my new t-shirts. Um, it's my friend Dana. He has a, you know, shirt thing going on liberty craze c-r-a-z-e.com and i want to give them a little bit of support as they've shown me support the bitcoin cpa.com kirk is the man he puts up with my horrible accounting skills <laughs> uh crypto compare.com they give lots of information um that i just usually source from brian uh <laughs> freeross.org you know you could click on their amazon link sex and science tower they also have an amazon link so if you want to buy something dirty that's where you go and a little piece of that action goes goes to brian and steph uh sovereign tech of course we're giving them some love uh volturo josh i love you buddy come back to the show um gold and bitcoin combined in one masterpiece at volturo.com uh, my own sites, uh, CryptoMediaHub.com. I do advertising and marketing consulting in the space. We help with events and different things like that. Um, BeautyCounter.com, where I'm getting my makeup from. I guess you go to slash Tatiana Moroz. If you want to get some cool makeup, try out some stuff and support me, you can go there. And of course, I don't know why I leave this last, but TatianaMoroz.com, where you can get my new record, uh, Keep the Faith. And we'll be, you know, I got to start singing on this show, just like doing some yeah. random... And I'll step it up. I'll step it up next time. I love everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Travis. Check out Travis's stuff. Uh, you can buy his new CD, like Funny in Ohio or something, on uh, on tourrecords.com. Um, sorry, I didn't write down the name and have it handy, but people know Travis Servine. He's awesome. Thanks again, Brian. You're the man. DarkAndroid.info to get my book. DarkAndroid.info. Oh, <laughs> DarkAndroid.info, mother ever. Yeah. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.